Oh, it all started with a desire to uh, go to mountaintops and see telescopes. For a long time, I was dreaming about just the exploration of these places where people are looking out at the cosmos. And, you know, and as you said, some of these are very hostile places. And uh, as I started exploring the idea, it turned out that uh, a lot of the things that I wanted to see, which are essentially experiments that physicists are doing to understand the universe, uh, a lot of these things are not just on mountain tops, but deep inside mines or you know beneath the surface of Lake Baikal, which is the largest lake in the world, um, or at, in Antarctica or at the South Pole. So it, it essentially became a journey of going to the extremes to understand how much work it takes to probe the universe, to understand where this universe came from, what you know, uh, and how it might end. All these big questions, profound questions in physics. Um, in equal measure, both. Because uh, one of the things I wanted to do in this book was uh, to bring about a feeling for physics and cosmology. So, um, and I use the travel writing as a device to bring about a certain quietness that I think makes the physics more, uh, you know, makes people appreciate the physics even more. And, uh, and as it happens, all the places that I went to, they are A, very extreme and, and so remote that silence is a natural part of these landscapes. So writing about them uh, was, going to these places and then writing about it uh, was profound. And then the physics, I've always found physics profound, so the combination just worked beautifully for me. When I went to uh, Lake Baikal in Siberia, uh, th this is an experiment being done by Russians, uh, which is a deep underwater detector. And uh, when I had uh, talked to my German uh, colleague, uh, a German scientist who had set up the whole trip, he said, why don't you bring with you a, a bottle of um, some liquor to share with the Russians because it's custom to do so. And uh, so on the fourth night, I still remember very clearly, uh, it, first of all, the, the team was working uh, late. I mean, we were waiting from about six in the evening to have this get together. And eventually they finished work at 11 o'clock and we all sat down and the bottle of whiskey vanished in, in a moment. And then magically from somewhere, two bottles of vodka turned up. And, and by the time we were through the half of that, uh, I discovered that two of the Russian uh, scientists, who were, one was 59, the other was in his 60s, remembered songs from Raj Kapoor films. And so we started singing, after having had considerable amount of whiskey and vodka. Um, uh, um, you know, the song from, uh, we were basically singing Avarahu. And the German scientists were looking at us and saying, should I understand this? This was so hilarious. Particle Collider, uh, which has started functioning now, I, I was lucky enough to go there when it was still being built. So I got to go in, into the tunnels and look at the detectors. And um, the, the detector itself will be creating energies that come very, very close to the kind of energy that existed just after the Big Bang. So to, to be in a place where you are confronted by technology. I mean, this is extremely high technology that, and people have been working for decades on it. They have their entire careers staked on what's uh, going to come out of this physics, this machine. So it, it really feels like you're standing in front of some huge modern cathedral. And this is really, uh, in, a, in a sense, these big experiments that I visited, and especially the Large Hadron Collider, I think they are like the cathedrals of, of our age because we don't build that kind of, those kind of cathedrals, temples anymore. But these are our temples. These are temples of our times. And, and just like you feel a certain kind of awe when you walk into a temple or a cathedral or a mosque, um, I can tell you for a fact that that kind of awe I feel when I walk into you know, the, the caverns that hold the Large Hadron Collider. Not necessarily an epiphany, but uh, in, in California, when I had gone to visit an uh, um, uh, observatory in Southern California called Mount Wilson. And then from there I traveled further up north to spend four or five days in a monastery because I wanted to write about the metaphor of monks on mountaintops looking into their own self and astronomers on mountaintops looking at the cosmos as you know, uh, comparable uh, disciplines for different reasons, but essentially still trying to understand nature and each in you know, ourselves. 
and I was in this monastery, it's a silent monastery, the only place where you can talk to anyone is in the reception area, so one day there was a monk there and I started telling him that, look, I've been traveling around the world and, uh, and I'm writing this book about telescopes and, and I've just come from Mount Wilson and uh, he says, oh, Mount Wilson, uh, you know the astronomer who built Mount Wilson, his name is George Hale. I said, yeah, I know. And he said, my name is Robert Hale. And, uh, and here I was trying to find a metaphor to link monks and astronomers. And he said then that George Hale and me, we come from the same Thomas Hale who left England in 1600s, came to America. So the monk and the astronomer were descended from the same Thomas Hale. And I was completely dumbstruck by this coincidence because I wasn't even looking for it. I was trying to find ways of telling people that monks and astronomers might be of the same breed. And here was a living example of two people from the same family. One becomes one of America's biggest astronomers and the other man becomes a silent monk. He, spe he sp spends his life in pretty much silence. This is the telescope in at uh, uh, Hanle in Ladakh. And when you're standing on the mountain top where the telescope is, right in front of you is a 400-year-old Buddhist monastery. And that was where it struck me very, very vividly that what the astronomers need for their work and what the monks need for their work is silence. Uh, monks need silence so that they can probe their own inner being. Astronomers need silence because without the silence, and for them, what I mean by silence is they need silence from light pollution, radio pollution, all kinds of pollution. They need clear skies, clear radio environment so that they can get these faint signals from the cosmos, which in a sense, if you think of what they're doing, they're looking back in time, looking to the Big Bang, looking to the very beginning of time. What the monks are doing is looking inside, trying to understand ourselves. I think they're all linked, the, the quests are linked. Good question, and uh, I, would, I would be uh, dishonest if I said I had an answer for it. Um, it, it the, the way I see it is that curiosity is a very basic human instinct and uh, once your basic needs are satisfied for some people like if you know once they're clothed then fed and have a shelter then curiosity for many of them is as basic a need and you I don't think you can stop that and all these things are an expression of that curiosity um, that's not to say that uh, so going to the moon is a different thing from trying to uh, build a telescope. So there are, you know, people will argue that those things are quite different. Uh, but in some sense, they're also related. And uh, uh, I think it's up to each society to figure out what the balance is, because uh, you need these kind of things. Like when you look back to the early 20th century, when quantum physics was beginning. Now, uh, at that time, we could have said, why should we do quantum physics? Who cares about you know, what's happening at the level of atoms and electrons and you know, things like that? And, and look now, everything we do, this television show that you're producing, the, the internet that we have, it wouldn't exist if we didn't understand quantum physics. And there are obvious benefits to that. Again, it's not to say all science, all technology is socially useful, but we have to pick and choose and draw, have a balance. I think uh, the beginning will be for the existing publications like newspapers and uh, magazines to uh, have a few, few of their staff really well trained in science writing which is actually a, a slightly different kind of journalism than uh, say political journalism because A it demands a certain kind of expertise in the science itself so you, know, you need to get familiar with the, the process of science. And, uh, and science fundamentally is a process that, ha that has at its heart integrity and honesty. And uh, journalism, unfortunately, you know, I'm part of that tribe. And you know, those things can vary over uh, the stories that you're doing. So with, for, for a science journalist, I think you have to buy into the process of science, which is that you have to have as much integrity about writing about the science as the scientist has about doing the work and you should be willing to question the scientist and we basically have to become the kind of journalist who would who would basic who would be skeptical of the scientist we in india have a tendency to uh, create a halo around uh, you know great scientists and we shouldn't do that they they are just as behold we should hold them uh, you know uh, we, we should basically question everything that they're doing and write a story from the, that perspective not accept what they're saying 
uh, and in doing so we'll process we'll participate in the process of science and uh, uh, it'll start with small steps with each publication having one or two really well trained uh, journalists and there's a responsibility uh, that lies with the scientists themselves they have to understand that uh, science is a public enterprise that it's uh, it's done for the public good that they are taking public money to do the science and hence they have a responsibility to speak to journalists to explain the science because it's not easy. Uh, a journalist who is general, uh, one day he's writing about physics, or the other day he's writing about biology, they're not experts and it's up to the scientists to take the time to explain what they're doing in clear terms. So it's a, it's a two-way street, both sides have to sort of step up the game.